I see a lot of people, you know, want to get into real estate, but then they're shut down. People think that, well, I have to find rental properties in my hometown to put my money in real estate. Welcome to the Freedom Point Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about creating more time freedom through passive real estate investing. Passive investing in real estate challenges conventional investment wisdom. We are passionate about learning and sharing resources with others who are ready to transform their investing mindset. Quick disclaimer as always, I am not a CPA, I am not an attorney or a financial advisor. This is not financial advice, not telling you or anyone else what to do. The views and opinions expressed in these podcasts are provided for education and informational purposes only and are not necessarily the views of my employer, ADP. I'm glad you're here. Now let's dig in. All right. Welcome back, Freedom Point podcast listeners. Thank you again for jumping into another episode of the Freedom Point. We're so glad you're here with us today again. Um, I have an amazing guest, uh, Susan Elliott. Susan, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for jumping in here. Um, A quick little background on Susan. Um, Susan is a real estate investor, an entrepreneur, an adventure athlete. That's kind of cool. She is a mother an investor education associate at Good Egg Investments. Uh, Susan also delights in creating educational and informational resources for investors that help them to connect their investment journey to living a more intentional life by design, which she knows goes hand in hand. Susan, wonderful. We all want that. So, Oh, yeah. That's why we're here. I mean, that's that's what brings us to investing. I think in the even if you're not able to identify that in the beginning, it's this internal calling that like something's got to change, something's better out there for me. So even if you haven't identified that you're investing to make your life more intentional, more meaningful, that's actually why you're doing it. Just just surprise. Yeah, totally. So now now that we've kind of come to the you know to that realization, and you have, and certainly I have, and there's other people listening to this podcast, you know, have gotten to that place or point in their own you know journey. Let's talk about your journey and kind of what led you up till today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, my we just and before we hit record, you and I were talking a lot about some traveling we did before. I don't know, but for me, it was before I became an investor. But my husband and I met in China, and we were both. Um, I was heavily involved in whitewater kayaking for about a year. Um, some might have called it my my dirt bag year, um, but I traveled all over the world. I taught high school for a traveling school. I taught kayaking. Certainly, I did a lot of writing. Anything I could do in the paddle sports community. Um, I, I still serve on some nonprofits that are river protection based, but that got me out and around into the world. But what it didn't do was create a solid financial base. In fact, I sort of was one of those people that was like, well, I'll, I'll always have to work. I'm never going to retire. I might as well not think about it. And that lasted for a good 10 years. And in my 30s, you know, the reality hit of like, no, no, this is something that I have to do. It's my social responsibility to take care of myself, I think. Um, as I saw my parents aging, you know, there's so many cues. I, I had of a family now. I have two young kids now. So that certainly shifted my perspective to I not only want to retire one day, but I kind of want to do it sooner than age 70, age 65, or whatever idea that I had about retirement. Luckily, I found real estate investing at that time. My husband and I bought our first home in 2019, so not even that long ago, but I bought it and had analyzed the deal and found a very specific type of property where I could take a single family home and convert it into a duplex to be able to first house hack ourselves a home, as well as then turn it into a great cash flowing rental. And we still own that duplex now, and it's phenomenal. I'm, and my plan then was like, oh, I'm just going to do this every year. This is great. I can do this with my, my full-time job. I was an engineer at the time doing river restoration work. Again, that's where the river comes into my life still. And um, But I, I began to see the potential in real estate, simultaneously seeing the limitations of the W-2 job as an engineer. And I, I loved the work I did and the people I worked with and the projects we worked on, but it was really like kind of a flatline professional growth. And even at that, in my small mountain town here in the Pacific Northwest, I was struggling to take care of my family, even as dual incomes, you know, us having now two young kids at home. So I um, I realized, one, that I couldn't hustle away as a landlord. 
because I have two young kids at home. I also have like some big health athletic goals of myself for myself. I know just to stay healthy, I have to maintain a pretty high level of activity. That's a, just a personal quirk of mine. And then, um, but two, I wanted to keep investing in real estate because I saw that potential. So I found passive real estate investments. I did a ton of research. I even started a company, um, with some friends to be able to help people invest in non-performing notes. And unfortunately, my business partners had to pivot into other businesses that they owned at the time. And so we have to had to put it on pause. But that's when I found Good Egg Investments. And, and I was able to come on now full time with them and be able to help other people in this mission, be able to continue to, to, to invest myself passively right now um, as an investor and and really kind of like make it my whole world now. And I just like, I'm so much more enjoying being immersed in this culture of people who are pursuing financial independence, pursuing a meaningful life, getting into investing, tackling these big kind of financial concepts um, that are, you know, oftentimes we're shut out of as normal people, as everyday citizens. You know, previously my mind thought, oh, because I'm just a kayaker, I'm an adventure athlete, I can't understand that world um, but then I'm like, well, if I could become an engineer, I can certainly become a real estate investor. I can certainly do this. So there's always, there's always a bridge, but that's kind of how I got to where, where I am today. That's great. I appreciate that. So, you know, how does someone like you that has all these kind of quintessential balls up in the air, right? You're a mother. Okay. Oh my goodness. You're so a, many. Or junkie. You're a, you know, a kayaker. You've got all these different things. You're involved with good egg investments. You've got a podcast of your own, you know, how does Susan balance it all? Oh, that's such a good question. And I, I don't think that one of my, one of my kind of accountability groups at one point, we talked about how you can have, you can juggle all the balls, but they can't all be glass balls, right? You can only have one or two glass balls that you're juggling with. The rest of them need to be rubber balls. And so basically like I'm, I'm prioritizing what is really most important in my life this year, this month, this week. Um, and that allows me to say no easier to other things. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I'm trying to do more running trail running these days and go longer and longer distances. So I've been running some 50 kilometer, you know, mountain running kind of events. Um, and I want to keep increasing that. That takes a lot of training and a lot of commitment, a lot of boring time running. Um, maybe boring to some people, but I'll listen to podcasts. I'll, I'll do other things that are kind of like keeping up my learning growth, but I'm also saying no sometimes to some of my girlfriends who want to just go grab wine at a four o'clock on a Friday when I'm not going to, I'm going to go run on the trails at that time period. But if you want to come and run with me, that'd be great. So I, I, I find ways to get my community. I find ways to get my, um, you know, spend time with my family, but also kind of serve in all of these other buckets, if that makes sense. But it's hard and it takes weekly planning to, I mean, I can't, I can't deny that when we can sit down, my husband and I on Sunday night, we just talked about this and say, okay, who's covering all the childcare versions because it's, they don't go to work nine to five. <laughs> That's for <laughs> sure. So we have to, we have to be really strategic about what we say yes to, um, and what we say no to, and we have to be intentional with our time and know that it, you know, we're living our best life now. I'm not just like slaving away to work for some future scenario. That's really important to me. My kids are really young right now. I want to enjoy every like juicy inch of that time period. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think everybody can do it, but you have to believe you can do it and you have to have some intentionality in there. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, you've brought up that word twice now being intentional and I think you nailed mm -hmm. it. Right. Um, I, I personally was a, uh, adrenaline junkie for a number of years, you know, ran 20 marathons, you know, biked in a wow. bunch of mountain bike races, did the trail runs, you know, all that kind of thing. The challenge for, for me is that, you know, once my kids got to be a little bit older, you know, my evenings and my weekends looked like a bag of Skittles, you know, on my calendar, <laughs> right? It was almost like my nine to five was a piece of cake. But yeah. my busy day started at five o'clock when it was time to retire from, you know, the W2 job for the day. Right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I totally get that side of being intentional and kind of balancing, you know, all of the things that you've got to, to, to take care of in your life. And to your point, like, do you really want to be doing all of those things, you know, when you're 70 years old, mm -hmm. when maybe your body isn't quite what it used to be, you know, when you were back in your 30s and 40s, you know, God willing, we hope that's the case. But the reality mm -hmm. is, is everybody is aging, we're all getting older. So, 
you know, my, my why as to why I personally started, you know, investing, you know, into real estate from a passive perspective was really so that I could accelerate, you know, those years to where I get to the point where now, you know, work is optional, right? Mm -hmm, you know, now mm -hmm. I don't have to quite trade as much of my time for money as maybe I did in some of my younger years. So that, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, the, your bag of Skittles is totally true. There's, it's, it's like full on, full time on when, as soon as work ends, sometimes I'm like rolling out my foot after a long weekend run or something at my desk. And it's just like, oh, this is my recovery time here at work. Um, very true. And, and I, and the passive investing, I think that's really common to those of us who have a lot of big goals and dreams for right now. And maybe that's in the shape of a, you know, a family that you want to spend time with. Maybe it's other types of professional goals you have currently or things you want to bring to the world in any way that have to happen now. They're time sensitive. Um, you know, I want my money to be working just as hard as if it was if I was active investing, but I, I don't believe that I have to slave away my time to get that to happen. If I, if I know how to evaluate deals, if I know how to look at a sponsor's track record, if I know how to also decide what types of investments are going to help me live my goals out right now and in 20 years, I'm able to leverage that passive investing to get more out of today as well as you know some future retirement scenario. Let's dial down on that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a chance to provide a little bit of a commercial to the listening audience. Let's talk about the Real Estate Accelerator Program and how that, whether specifically yourself or other investors you talk to, how does the Real Estate Accelerator Program shape your approach and your investors' approach to real estate investing? Great question. Well, our real estate accelerator program is actually how we help people raise um, more more capital on their own for real estate deals. So it's a little bit like the the senior level investor where, you know, we do with Good Egg Investments, we have investment offerings opened all the time for different types of passive investments. Right now that's looking a lot like um, hotel deals because they're great options in this market. We're still looking for good multifamily deals, but they're looking differently. And we're also also opening up preferred equity investing options for everyday investors Whereas that used to be kind of only available for institutional investors to come in in that capital gap. It's also a way for our investors to get fixed income uh, based on an interest rate, as well as that upside payment that we all love at the end of a deal um, as real estate investors. And then our real estate accelerator program is for those people that's like, I want to do this. I want to be in real estate. I have all of these friends and family, for instance, that also want to join in real estate. Can we somehow all come in together and buy an asset um, and so, you know, these are these are the people that can want to bring in a million dollars, two million dollars into a deal in a fund to fund model, for instance, and maybe even scale to where they're buying the building outright in the future on their own. And we're able to, you know, help them build their brand, help them build their thought leadership platform and just help them understand what it means to serve investors and to work with investors. Got it. That makes sense. So let's talk then about the the actual uh, investor. OK, so this is that maybe higher net worth individual that has their retirement completely locked into Wall Street, okay? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. When I say locked in, right, it's locked in a 401k, it's locked in an IRA, right? You know, their friend Bob has told them about, you know, this great new stock pick and, you know, sometimes <laughs> the oh, investor Bob. gets it right and 90% of the time they get it wrong, that kind of a thing. So yeah. let's speak specifically to that investor. So. What types of mistakes have you seen those types of investors making prior to them engaging with you and getting started in passive real estate investing? Absolutely. I think that that investor is very common. I mean, that's most of our friends and family out there. If they're even fortunate enough to have built up a great 401k savings, they've been uh, matching that amount that they can invest every every year. Maybe they have a self-directed IRA and you're putting it into the stock market. 
Um, now that gets tied up. It also is is really pretty volatile as far as if you want to withdraw any of that money. There's there's ways you can do that early if you want to retire early, but it's tricky. Um, now, if you're investing inside a money market account, then that could be easier because it's not um, there's no none of those retirement rules that are associated with that. But we see people kind of like seeing that portfolio grow and realizing it's all kind of even though it's in different companies. Ideally, you're diversified across different companies. You're not picking stocks. Perhaps you've found index fund investing, for instance. Um, but it's all in the stock market. And I think people just start to see other people owning real estate and realize that's a great diversification play. Oh, and wait, those other people owning real estate are getting pretty consistent cash flow often, and they're getting an upside. So like their principal is growing, plus their cash flow is coming in, but their principal is not decreasing. Whereas if I start withdrawing 4% or whatever my percentage is from my um, stock portfolio, if I'm not at a certain threshold, that number is going to continue to go down. It's not going to grow. So I see a lot of people you know, want to get into real estate, but then they're shut down because most people don't think, people think you have to slave away as a landlord. People think that, well, I have to find rental properties in my hometown to be able to, to put my money in real estate. I have to Maybe they know I could hire property managers, but then you have to manage the property managers and your portfolio and your expenses and your taxes, all of these things. And so we're really trying to help people that, you know, think that buying a large 250 unit multifamily building is pretty off limits or a, you know, a Hampton Inn. Like, how could I own a Hampton Inn? I'm an everyday person. I, I, I have a W-2 job. But when you come together as a group, these things are possible. And the returns are just as good, if not better, than when you manage your own rental property down the street. Um, so, And then you can diversify within real estate, too. The different types of distributions that you're getting, the different types of growth, your different risk profiles. Um, I'll give you an example. For me, most of my personal real estate investing right now is a little bit more long term. I'm not trying to get monthly cash flow. I'm not trying to get quarterly cash flow to live off of right now because my top goal is to build that nest egg down the road. Um, now, that down the road might be 10 years. It's not 25, it's not 40, but I'm not really thinking about optimizing my investments for that greater, more stable, even fixed cash flow amount these days. Whereas you might have someone who is looking to retire, whether that's in their 30s or in their 60s, right? And they might be looking more about like, well, I want a little bit more security and knowing that I'm going to get that 6%, 7 8% um, distribution regularly. Like which types of investments are going to give me uh, lower risk to that number changing. Um, but also still, I mean, we're all in real estate. We want our principal just to be growing over time. So there's lots of different flavors within real estate investing, but people don't, I think, see that until they they just start start down that road of looking into it. Yeah, and absolutely. And that's one of the really ni nice parts about investing into real estate is depending upon which season of life you're in, which I think is kind of what you're, you know, uh, speaking to there, you know, there are different types of investments that you can get into, you know, there are ones that are a little bit more risk, you know, risky than others, right? You know, there's ones that provide maybe a higher cash on cash return or preferred return, maybe with mm -hmm. no equity upside. You know, there's opportunities with no preferred return and the higher equity upside. So exactly, there's a lot of different exactly. things that play. And I know one of the things that you had uh, indicated, Susan, was um, the asset class of hotel investing. Um, mm -hmm. I have not yet had anybody on the show speak specifically about that asset class. Would you mind just sharing a couple of things about you know, why hotel investing, you know, is different than maybe the traditional, you know, multifamily, you know, value add investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love hotel investing because it is so different from multifamily. So you have very different, um, you know, tenants, they're daily tenants, they're not uh, monthly tenants. You can change your cash flow. You can tweak it really quickly per month, whereas it's not sort of month or two month renovation cycles. It's very quick unit by unit changes that you can make. It's very dynamic in that way. Um, Specifically, I like these business travel hotels, right? So these are not the luxury hotels that are really at the whim of the, the tourism markets. They're a little bit more susceptible to global market shifts, to changes in consumption, to all of these. These business travel hotels are, are quite stable in the areas that we're looking at because they're based on construction. They're based on 
travel in and out of a you know a, an, an army base, for instance, that's not changing over time. That is a solid thing there. And maybe the construction or the business travelers that are coming in and out of those hotels, that's an industry that's in place there. And business travel has picked up since COVID. It's not something that's kind of gone away with remote work. A lot of people think that, well, we're all remote. That, that's actually necessitating us to get together at these events a little bit more often than, than we're seeing previously because we're not in the office with, with people anymore. So business travel is kept up this whole time. It's a little bit more steady as you go. Um, and so these, these buildings continue to appreciate over time, but there's better cash flow in the beginning. And I, I did just mention that I'm not going for the cash flow in the beginning, but I'm reinvesting it all as kind of my play there. And I just like that because it's, it's not as um, susceptible to changes in, um, in rental rates or to movement migration patterns of people in living um, areas, that sort of thing. It's just, again, it's a different diversification play. Yeah, totally. And and yeah, absolutely. Now, one question that I have then with hotel investing, you know, are there similar like depreciation benefits to the investor? Um, are the hotel investments that you make available to investors, are those traditionally value add opportunities where maybe the plan is to maybe hold the properties for, I don't know, two to seven years, something like that? Is that kind of the, the, the overall strategy? Yeah, pretty much. They're they're not um, they're not as value add heavy as some of the multifamily projects that we've done in the past, um, or that you'll see out there. We're not um, going through and specifically renovating room by room, but we're doing value add projects that are um, you know improvements to the amenities, to the facilities, even to the branding and the name of the organization. There's certainly operational um, improvements, efficiencies that we can put into place. So we are increasing the value by adding value as we go. And these are, you're right, they're the same type of hold time structures. We Right now we're, we're underwriting everything for the five-year hold time, five to seven years, um, especially in this market cycle where we're not really wanting to sell anything right now uh, that we have. Uh, the The market to sell is just not as good. So, so similar structure like that. Um, we have um, different investment classes. It, it looks really similar, you know, as you look at the capital stack, as you look at the different places you could come in as an everyday investor um, for the different amounts. You know, what your your proceeds split would be, the hold time, the equity multiples. It's pretty similar to multifamily, um, but I would say that it's a little bit heavier in that getting your preferred return. For instance, our existing ho hotel portfolio is consistently delivering 11% annually to our investors, even in this market cycle, even where, you know, some many investments are pausing distributions right now in 2023 um, to be able to hold that money into reserves, to refinance or whatever they need to do down the road. Um, the, the hotels just are just really consistent in this market cycle. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your podcast uh, because you are the co-host on the Life and Money show. So my yeah. question for you is that what themes or topics do you find that most resonate with your audience? We talk a lot about real estate investing, but I, we, we come at it from the lifestyle angle a lot too, and just talking about why we invest. I think that we can get really clouded up with the technical side of investing and get caught up in optimizing all of the nuanced numbers and um, rates and investment amounts and never stop and ask like, how is this actually improving my life? How am I building a life that I want to, um, you know, how am I helping spread this message to other people? For instance, we just had a great show where we talked about, you know, talking about finance with our kids, um, talking about investing tips and strategies you can do to, to be able to integrate that into your family life as well. Um, we also talk a lot about just like, the steps along the path to financial independence and financial freedom. And it's not always just like, have you looked at your spending and your expenses and your investments amounts and your savings ratio? It's also about what do I, how do I want to be living my life now? And how can I kind of tweak my lifestyle? So I'm, you know, living what we call life by design right now. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Before we had an opportunity to um, hit the record button on this podcast episode, we caught up a little bit about some of our international travels. Um, specifically, we honed in on our Asia travels. So yeah. would love to hear, would love to hear from a personal perspective, maybe what was one of the most, you know, one or one or two of the most memorable um, experiences you had in traveling abroad. Oh my goodness. Well, I met my husband in, um, in China and I was teaching high school for a traveling kayaking high school. And, um, 
what was kind of funny is, I mean, I had like 13 young boy students, high school students, very, very good kayakers, class three to five, you know, pretty much expert level kayakers. So there was a good bit of ego in that group of boys. I'm good friends with them all now. So um, it's fun to think back. But I, I met Adam uh, my first semester working, which was this this China semester. And we went on an eight day upper, you know, um, Yangtze trip. We went on the Mekong, we paddled in the Mekong and the Salween. We traveled kind of all over China. But towards the end of that quarter, I began to start to get a crush on this boy that was helping us facilitate all these trips. He was managing the rafting company that we were working with. And so it was just kind of funny because I was sneaking around a little bit with my, my now husband because I didn't want you know, it just felt like a role reversal of like, aren't these high school boys supposed to be sneaking around and doing things like, you know, that, you know, they're not supposed to be doing, but it was really the teacher that was doing that. But, you know, Adam and I, we, we have this such a deep foundation in, in travel to really remote, but gorgeous regions. So we've been all over China, but I've never been to Shanghai. I've never been to other than maybe airport transfers, that sort of thing, these big cities. We did spend some time in Beijing. But I, I would say that like what that has done for me has given me such great perspective on just the way that everybody can live and those happiness values that we all get. And and really it, it helps me check my own lifestyle as we go. I would say that like being an adventure outdoor enthusiast too is like checked me in my um, you know, when I get busy, caught up in the haves and have nots of what I want in this life, material possessions, I'm always able to go back to like what actually brings us happiness. And because I've, I've seen it in so many different forms across the world. And I know that I don't need much to be happy and that it actually isn't in material possessions. It's in things like friends and family and people and laughter and, and these things. So I think it's like been a superpower in my own journey to financial independence is to be able to recall these years of travel and now to even, you know, start to take my kids on some, some big world travel trips as we're going to be doing here in the coming times. <laughs> well, maybe that's the answer to my next question. And that is what is on Susan's next bucket list item, whether that be personally or professionally? Yeah. Well, I, um, I guess I'll, I'll go there. I want to, my daughter's in kindergarten this year, but we want to enroll her in a school, hopefully in Chile or Pat or you know, in the Patagonia region, Chile or Argentina, um, so that we can spend a school year abroad in a Spanish speaking country. Um, we can all take Spanish classes, but my husband and I will be fully remote workers. We'll work from home, um, work from, from a different country and, and start to get that experience for our kids too, where they're seeing the way that other people live their lives. Um, different different cultural experiences is a big part of our value system. And so we're looking to do that. I don't think it, I don't know if it'll be first grade. So I don't think it'll start next fall, but soon enough, we have a wonderful dog that we still have here. So we don't want to take him with us to Patagonia. He's currently our, uh, keeping us here in our home base, which we love too. Yeah, absolutely. What would be uh, maybe one or two uh, book or other podcast recommendations that you'd make to that um, investor out there that's looking to maybe get started, um, you know, in real estate investing? Yeah, great question. Well, I think that I bet you a lot of your guests have great, you know, all the standard real estate investing books or, or just like think and grow rich style of mindset books that are pretty foundational. And I, I like to check in on books like that every once in a while or Robert Kiyosaki stuff. I mean, um, but, but I think that I, I would encourage every real estate investor to also pick up um, the Designing Life by Bill Evans. I think uh, or it might be Dave Evans. Oh my goodness. I'm forgetting it now, but um, basically like a book on lifestyle design. And um, these are two Stanford professors who teach this at Stanford. They teach it all over the world now. And it's a great framework, not just to like, okay, I'm going to take on this framework or this, these ideas right now and make some changes and then move on. It's like, you're giving yourself a design thinking system to be able to evaluate every new decision and continually evolve towards you know, optimizing your life for exactly where you want to be. And that's involved in like small little prototyping changes. It's not these big sweeping, quit my job, move to Fiji and just start anew. It's little tiny tweaks that are aligning with your value systems. You're testing things, you're experimenting. It can be a really fun process. And I would encourage people to take on a book like that as they get into their investing. It's also a really great thing to do in this like the boring middle of investing. I like you get really excited in the beginning of investing. You're making investments. It's really fun. And then you realize like, oh, I just have to like do this for 10 years, 20 years now. Like, 
well, there's not much difference. You know, I mean, you're learning about new things, but you're investing for the long term, right? And so keeping sw- switching your focus to saying, okay, now that I'm on that consistent path of steadily investing every year, I'm making investments um, into 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 different types of assets, but I'm also investing time into myself to like build towards what do I want to do with my time now that I'm going to start to get it back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's a continual refining process along your journey. Mm-hmm. So almost requires kind of a, a daily, you know, weekly renewing, you know, of what your goals and, and plans are for the future. So appreciate that. Um, really a pleasure having you on the show today. I really appreciate the the value that you've been able to provide and to bring to our listening audience. Um, what would be a couple of different ways that our uh, listeners could uh, reach out to you to learn more about what you're up to? Absolutely. Well, you can always reach me at Susan at goodegginvestments.com. Um, I would encourage you to listen to the Life and Money show. Annie and I are on that um, every other week. We publish episodes and we would love to hear if you want to hear anything else from us. Um, I also host a weekly popover event, which is just a casual chat. It's at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. It's every Tuesday. So if you um, find goodegginvestments.com and get onto our email list, you'll be notified of those every week. We also have an events page on our website where you can just click right into it if you want. And that's a great weekly time where you can talk to myself or another one of the Good Egg um, people to ask questions about anything, about specific offerings we have, about lifestyle design, about what we're doing. It's a time for you guys to get to know us. So please join me. Um, join me on a Tuesday. It's great. Well, we will definitely put those resources in the show notes here. Um, Susan, again, really appreciate you know your time that you've been able to spend with us today. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy. Likewise. Absolutely. And uh, listening audience, thank you again for joining another episode of The Freedom Point. We look forward to having you join us on the next episode. Thank you for hanging out with us today and for listening to the Freedom Point podcast powered by Starting Point Capital. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on this show should be considered financial advice. Before making any financial decision, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Freedom Point podcast. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. If you're interested in connecting, you can find contact information at startingpointcapital.com.